I have the privilege of being the pastor at a parish that has a really iconic church in the Denver metro area. Risen Christ Catholic Parish completed its construction in 1970, and we're well known among Catholics and people who are not Catholic for our interesting shaped roof. Our ceiling uh, is arched and it, 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 it starts off low in the back of the church and, and gets high towards the sanctuary. So it kind of looks like we have a ski slope or a ski jump. And so some people will call it Ski Jesus or the Ski Jump Church. And our church was built kind of at the end of this, this phase in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in Denver when a lot of modern architecture was really happening and some interesting looking buildings around Denver. Uh, in fact, the architect who uh, was working on our church was also working on the Denver Art Museum at that time, uh, which was also a unique looking building. Our church was featured even in a Woody Allen film called The Sleeper. And as you can see from the screenshot from that film, uh, you see one of the entrances of the church and uh, the ski slope, the top of the ski slope in the distance, and a couple of spaceships up in the front because it was a kind of a sci-fi movie a little bit that uh, Woody Allen was making there. And so our church is iconic, our church is interesting, and some people are really drawn to our church because it is so interesting. And soon our parish is gonna begin the project of beginning to design and remodel the sanctuary, the confessionals and the bathrooms. There's some updates that really need to be made. But I've been thinking a lot about architecture, church architecture in particular, why? Why do we build churches? What's the ultimate purpose of a church? And what is good church architecture, at least in the Catholic realm? When we look at the history of Christianity, there were no church buildings in the first couple of centuries. Christianity was not yet legalized. It was not allowed to gather and, and have buildings and that sort of thing for the Christian community. Um, so Christians would get together to celebrate the liturgy, to celebrate the mass in people's homes or in the cemeteries and that sort of thing. But with the legalization of Christianity, especially once Christianity became the uh, religion of the Roman Empire, uh, it really started to take off. We started to see churches being built. And churches were always being built to endure. I guess that's one thing that really stands out for me, that whenever Catholics build a parish, we want to build something that will last. We don't build something that we expect to grow out of and then we're going to go to some other part of town and, and stay in some other place. We build something that looks like a church, feels like a church, because there's something that's really unique that happens at the Mass. And I think that's really the foundation for all church architecture, of, of everything that we're considering. When we consider what is a good church, when we're building or remodeling a parish, what makes for a good church? Ultimately, it comes down to the fact that Jesus is proclaimed in that building in a really unique way, right? We read the scriptures, uh, we proclaim uh, the gospel and invite people to respond to that gospel, to give their life to Jesus. And then Jesus becomes present in a really powerful and unique way in the sacrament that happens on that altar. And then he resides in the tabernacle afterwards. So the entire building is really intended to help people have an encounter with Jesus, to hear his word, to respond to him, and to receive him in the Eucharist. As Catholics, whenever we design and build a church, our goal is always to help a person have a deeper experience of Jesus. We want a person, while they're standing in that space, while they're in that sacred space of the church, to open themselves up more deeply. And we want the place to help them to do that. So they're more receptive to hearing Jesus in the scriptures. So that they're more open to actually receiving the graces that Jesus wants to give in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. And so I would say maybe we can condense this whole thing down to a few different points that ultimately Christian Catholic architecture wants to lead a person into an experience of truth and goodness and beauty. I'd say that's the main thing. We want a person to experience truth and goodness and beauty because those three things are always going to point to God. Good Catholic architecture leads us to the truth. I think we see that especially if you look at older churches. There's so much symbolism. There's so much that's intended through the stained glass and through different elements you'll find in churches. I think a great example is the chapel where I went to school, St. John Vianney Seminary. St. John Vianney has this gorgeous chapel built in the 1930s. And as you progress from the back of the church closer to the tabernacle, the floor is beautiful from the beginning, but the floor gets more intricate because you're getting closer and closer to Jesus. Same thing with the ceiling. The ceiling is beautiful from the beginning, but as you get closer and closer to Jesus, it becomes more intricate, more beautiful, as if you're getting closer to God himself, because you are. Uh, and in the sanctuary, or sorry, in the nave, uh, there's 12 pillars, as reminded, there's 12 apostles, and that we're seated among them, as if we're seated among the communion of saints every time we're at mass, and there's a, a, a medallion of a dove that hangs above the altar, as a reminder that the Holy Spirit descends upon the altar to transform bread and wine into Jesus' body and blood. Everything about the building teaches. 
I think that uh, in our own church here at Risen Christ, we have some beautiful stained glass. I think they do a good job of teaching some truths of the Christian life. We see in the bottom three uh, windows of that stained glass a presentation on uh, the Paschal mystery. We see the Last Supper, we see the crucifixion, we see Jesus' resurrection. Uh, then we have the descent of the Holy Spirit. Uh, is, the, is right above that, which we enjoy every time we come to the Mass, when that Holy Spirit descends upon the altar and then fills all of us with a, a deeper, deeper love and a desire to proclaim the Gospel. And then that top stained glass is an image of uh, the Lamb who was slain from the book of Revelation. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of a reminder that every time we're at Mass, uh, we're stepping into the, the Lamb's Supper that is talked about in the book of Revelation. Uh, that we're, in some ways, experiencing a foretaste of what is to come for all of eternity. So the stained glass, in a way, teaches us and draws us into this Eucharist because this Eucharist is an experience of the Last Supper and the crucifixion and the resurrection and the Holy Spirit is there and it's a foretaste of the things of heaven. So the architecture of a Catholic church should lead us to a deeper experience of the truth. And this, in a similar way, the architecture of a church should lead us to a deeper experience of goodness. And it's hard to portray goodness, right? Uh, it's maybe more of a sense, it's more of a feeling. Uh, if you've ever sat inside of a church by yourself, often there's a sense of peace, there's a piece of serenity, a sense of serenity there. God is present. We know somehow in our heart that it's good that we are there, uh, that our good God is there. And when we're with the community, hopefully there's that sense that it's, it's good that we're together. So that's maybe a harder thing to kind of capture, but ultimately the church design should help to facilitate that. It shouldn't feel like a dangerous place or a scary place or an ugly place. Uh, the serenity, the gentleness, the goodness of the place should resonate within our hearts because that goodness helps us to experience the goodness of God in some ways. And maybe the final but most important piece of all this is the beauty of the church. We've always been convinced of the importance of beauty as Catholics. And I get that in some ways there's a certain subjectivity to beauty, right? If you look at pictures of yourself from middle school and high school, you probably look at your clothes and your hair and the glasses that you wore at that time and you think to yourself, how did I think that that was a good idea or that I thought that was looking good, right? So in some ways, the, uh, some tastes when it comes to beauty do change. But there does seem to be a certain objective beauty out there. You can experience it in maybe old buildings that have been around for a long time and, and almost anybody can appreciate uh, how enduring this place is and the solid materials and, and the craftsmanship behind things. For me, uh, when I stand at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., it is a stunning structure. Not only does the building proclaim truth with the words on the walls uh, from Abraham Lincoln, but there's something about the craftsmanship and the peace of that place that, to me, communicates beauty. And I think it resonates with our American heart when we stand in that place. We experience something generally that's beautiful. Uh, same thing uh, when we step inside of any old church. Go stand inside of St. Peter's Basilica, stand inside the cathedral here in Denver. They are stunning structures, and almost everybody will agree with that. You could take 100 people who completely disagree on whether or not there is truth or whether or not certain things are good or bad, but if you stood them all in front of the same sunset, I would bet that most of them would agree that that sunset is beautiful. So for us, we are committed to portraying beauty because we really believe that beauty can be the entry point for truth or the entry point for goodness. We may not be able to convince somebody in our subjective world on what is true or what is good, but if we can win their heart over with beauty, that maybe opens up a place to be able to have the conversation about truth and goodness because they can look at this thing, they can experience this thing and say, wow, that's beautiful. And in some ways, because it is beautiful, it also seems to be true and it seems to be good. So truth, goodness, and beauty, those three things become an entry point into the life of God himself. We always build churches to endure. We don't intend to build something that can easily be transformed into a coffee shop or a, a funeral home or something else afterwards, as if we expect that we're gonna somehow die out. We build, like we're planting a, a flag in the ground. We will proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in this place. We will make Jesus Christ present in this part of town or in this part of our state. We have a real commitment that we wanna build something that will last, something that will endure. And so somehow we have to create not just an experience of truth, goodness, and beauty, but do it in a way that shows that these three things will always endure. Just like God, who is truth, goodness, and beauty itself, 
will always endure and he is always with us. So the next time you find yourself staring up at the stained glass in a Catholic church or just sitting in the pews and enjoying the peace and the serenity of that beautiful place, thank God for the ways in which that church has led you to a deeper encounter with himself. God bless you.